<coughs> less harmful kind. Because it's not sinful. It doesn't create havoc in society. But it's still attachment. So because of that attachment, they get problems. But this, uh, the sages, the sainted persons are there. And they come and instruct. You know, the, the householders lament, why do I have so many problems? Because you're attached. Oh. And you should break that attachment. Become free. Dedicate yourself completely to Krishna consciousness. And become happy. See, attachment, whether it's sinful or uh, under vague regulation, it never brings happiness. This is the point. <laughs> this, this, is, uh, this is the thing that two kinds of attachments have in common. That people are becoming attached because they think, I'll be happy by illicit sex or illicit sex. They're thinking, this will make me happy, but it won't. It brings suffering. Illicit sex brings so much suffering. It condemns one. After this life, in this human body, and one is taken down to hell, and uh, one gets a very hot lover, <laughs> sex partner. <laughs> made of iron <laughs> and heated red hot. <laughs> and this you can embrace. And then after after that sojourn in hell, then uh, then the unfortunate living entity is released into the lower species and there uh, can pers pursue sex life in so many abominable ways. Long, long, long time before coming back to the human form. Whereas licit sex, it does not lead to a hellish reaction like that. But still it binds one to the bodily concept which is full of suffering. So it must be broken ultimately. Yes, so uh, then their activities uh, can be engaged by those who are properly situated in Krishna consciousness. You know, there's a... Uh, I was speaking with Vishwadev Prabhu yesterday, so he was talking about some devotees who he says, in his terms, he says, they're they're there. <laughs> In other words, they're part of the community of devotees. But they're <clears throat> not very strict in the regulations of devotional service. But they're part of the community and they're, they're doing something, making some contribution. So being part of the community means to accept superior direction, direction of those who are spiritually, more spiritually advanced. So those who are more spiritually advanced can help such a person engage himself in Krishna's service. So they have they have a good quality of being humble, submissive. See, this is the point again. They're not thinking themselves independent. They're not trying to assert themselves in some uh, uh, independent way. You can't tell me what to do. I understand better than you what I can do. For this. So, uh, such persons just fall down. But because they're honest, they're admitting, yes, I'm not very advanced, but I'm, I must, I cannot do anything else except 
serve the devotees, so let me dwell somewhere, in some corner, <laughs> where I can render some service. So actually their, their position is, uh, is very auspicious. Now, of course, they, we, we are hoping that such persons, after some time, will also become purified by the service to the Vaishnavas and gradually develop a taste for hearing and chanting. Because this is really uh, the secure position. When one becomes secure in one's spiritual practices, then we can say with certainty that this devotee is on his way back home, back to Godhead. But when one is not, then we cannot say for sure. It may be, because Krishna is very merciful. But the whole point, especially if one accepts spiritual master, and this means one is duty-bound, uh, to become established in devotional service nicely. They want, you know, th this is another point, being honest. Srila Prabhupada said, the initiation, it is a gentleman's agreement. Uh, so one should fully understand what it means to be initiated. Now you've agreed to your spiritual master that I will follow four regulatory principles, chant 16 rounds, <laughs> So one should do that. One should think this over very carefully before entering into that agreement. Otherwise, one can make an offense to the spiritual master. I found that the uh, uh, shudras in the Vanashrama system, that they are not paid, they just get the leftovers from the higher caste. So, uh, how is it in, in practical life in modern times when uh, when we engage for example shudras in some service we have you know, that we have to pay them that we, that they were not accepted just to to be like a, what we call life I you know, just to work and get some something to eat well uh, there are some persons like that I mean I think we were just talking about them <laughs> Persons who live in the company of devotees, but they're not very spiritually advanced. But they're very much attached, very much surrendered to serving the Vaishnavas. And, uh, and they fully depend upon the mercy of the Vaishnavas. So, I suppose they could be called shooters. And they're people who are less than shooters. So in these less than shooters, they're difficult to even engage nicely. When they want payment in return, then, you know, Srila Prabhupada said, just like when workmen come to do some work in the temple, uh, the only benefit they get from that work is the money that we pay them. Of course, we try to give them prasadam, you know, then they get more benefit. But simply from the work, because they want payment, the only benefit they get is the money. For someone who is volunteering his service, then he gets the benefit of serving the Vaishnavas, and through the Vaishnavas serving Krishna. That's eternal benefit. And also one question about the Brahmins in, in the Vedic culture. Um, it said that they are not, when they do something wrong, some crime, they are not punished in the same way as, as a shudra, for example, mm -hmm. uh, because they are respected. Uh, but isn't it that then that uh, when one has uh, more knowledge about what he has to do and not to do, it, that he has more responsibility and has to be punished actually more severe? Well, Brahmana, you know, is, was never considered, of course, 
we, we must say now, we're talking about earlier ages, not Kali Yuga. In Kali Yuga now in India, you know, Brahmins, they, they do something, they're punished just like everybody else. Because they're not really Brahmins anymore. They're just ordinary people. But in earlier ages, anyone who was a Brahmana, who was even, even born in a Brahmin family, even just to get that opportunity, he could not be an ordinary person. And also in, in the earlier uh, ages, uh, the Brahmanas educated their children properly, not like today. So these Brahmanas were qualified. Very highly, and, and it was a Vedic culture that was basically, they respected the Brahmana community because of their good qualities. Now if some Brahmana goes wrong, uh, then, yes, he was not to be punished. He could be banished from the kingdom if he did something really bad. Of course, even, even under circumstances, a Chetriya can kill a Brahmana. But only if the Brahmana uh, resists the Chetriya, if the Brahmana opposes. The Chetriya comes to administer the, the punishment on the Brahmana. In other words, tell the Brahmana, now you leave my kingdom. And the Brahmana would, by violence, oppose the Chetri. And the Chetri would kill the Brahmana. This is declared in the Mahabharata. This is why when Arjuna uh, came to Draupadi Svayanvar and he won the contest, then the uh, Chetris, they, they had become so uh, attached to Draupadi that they wanted to just forcibly take her away. They were thinking uh, that, uh, you know, this Draupadi is a princess and this, this, this is a contest of arms. It should be just for Chetriyas. Why Brahmins are coming here? So they felt like this. So they thought, let us just take Draupadi. So in the beginning, they, they didn't intend to do this by making violence against Arjuna. Because Arjuna, he was dressed as a I, I, if you don't know, he was dressed as a Brahmin. They thought he was a Brahmin. So they just wanted to take Draupadi. But then Arjuna, he started firing arrows. <laughs> he was resisting them. So then they said, all right. <laughs> so if he's going to fight, then we're going to fight. <laughs> and there was a big battle. But the Chetriyas were unsuccessful. So because of the qualities of a Brahmana, he should not be punished severely. Yes, he should know better. And uh, if he has really misused his knowledge, then he will be severely punished. But not by the Chetriyas, by Yamaraj. Yamaraj is the supreme punisher in this universe. So earthly Chetriyas, they don't, they don't want to severely punish the Brahmanas because they feel the Brahmanas are superior to them. But after this lifetime, Lord Yamaraj will take care of them. Yes? There's a question from Dr. Marcus. He asked, why do people make themselves dependent upon sense gratification? and forget the liberation of Supreme. Why? Well, this is the age-old story of the world. <laughs> this is the way things are. People are in mind. Simple answer. Yes? We were talking about the Yakshas. Uh, why is it mentioned that Kuvera is the chief of the Yakshas? Yeah, Kuvera is the treasure of the demigod. He's called Yaksharaj because he uses the Yakshas to guard his treasure. He keeps the treasure in the Himalayan mountains. And uh, the Yakshas haunt that place and anybody who goes there looking for that treasure, they will be killed or captured or deluded, misled by the Yakshas. So they're all surrendered to Kuvera.
Okay. Uh, is it is it likely because we meant to understand that in the olden days they used to find golds and other things on the Himalayas? And normally, when there are golds and other things, dwarfs and uh, other entities like the golds and uh, other beings, like so, can it be stated that the dwarfs are all among the yaksha groups? Yeah. Well, you know, there's there's yakshas and there's rakshashas and there's pisachas and there's uh, bhutas and there's uh, there's a whole you know, menagerie of. Uh, <laughs> These sort of living entities who give trouble to human beings. So the dwarfs and the whatever else, strange beings, they fall into these categories. So, so that that mean because in other countries, in other mountains where there are jewels and treasures like golds and ornaments mm -hmm. like this, there are also entities like that too. So does that mean it is only on the Himalaya mountains where various treasury is being guided there or? throughout the whole world. Because in some world places also, which is not in India or Malaya, there are such things and there are other entities like this there. Sometimes they reward the people when they go there to search for it. Well, Srila Prabhupada once, I remember Srila Prabhupada once saying that the Himalayas extend over the whole world. So, uh, that could be. There are enchanted treasures in other places which belong to the demigods. But there are different classes of demigods too. Kuvera is guarding the treasure of the great demigods like Lord Indra. But there are lesser demigods. For instance, Gandharvas. They're Upadevas. They're like uh, semi-demigods. And they also have treasure. They're not they're not so directly under the, uh, the control of Lord Indra. They have their own, they will have their own king. They have their own place where they dwell above the earth. So they also, and they have their special reserved areas on this planet where they come down to enjoy. And then they also keep treasure on them. For a human being, a, a Gandharva is a demigod. If a human being sees a Gandharva, then uh, he thinks this is a wonderful personality. Mm. Is, it, uh, is it true that uh, a Kshatriya acting in Krishna consciousness only learn to kill and eat the meat of spiritual understanding and fight with his enemies with spiritual knowledge? Because when we're talking of Kshatriya's eating meat, but I think the Kshatriyas acting in Krishna consciousness are different from the Kshatriyas acting on the material platform. Yeah, if, if a Kshatriya is a... Uh, he, he may become very uh, uh, dedicated to Vaishnava principles. And then he may give up meat eating entirely. But you, you just must understand, it's a Kshatriya's dharma. If he goes out hunting, he may eat meat and there's no sin. And among the Pandavas, Srila Prabhupada said that four Pandavas were vegetarian, but one, Bhima, <laughs> he was not. <laughs> so, you know, there's no sin. So, there, there's no need for us to try to make, you know, to try to understand this, make some mental adjustment become so much concerned. Why these Chaturis eat meat? What? No. <laughs> it just means that we are uh, trying to understand their activities from our position and that we should not do. Yeah, what I want to understand is although Chaturis eat meat, but a Chaturia acting in Krishna consciousness, he eat the meat of spiritual understanding and he tries to kill his enemy with spiritual knowledge. That is what I want to do. But we're talking about Vedic Chaturis. Um, I mean, th this sounds, what you're saying sounds like more of a figurative, you know, we can, like you said late yesterday, the, the, the battle between uh, the Krishna consciousness movement and the Asuric civilization, 
So this is more figuratively, and then we can say we're all soldiers and Lord Chaitanya's army and so on. So that's, that's all very nice. But, uh, <laughs> from this we should not draw conclusions about the Vedic Chatriyas. Yes. Yeah.